we love to tell stories with happy endings. Oh, we like seeing the man with the white hat, you know, ride in on the white horse, you know, to rescue the damsel in distress, you know, and to defeat the cowboy in the black hat, you know, with the black horse, you know, and to see, you know, of course, you know, the good guys win. And one way you can tell the difference between a movie or a story that's sometimes written in America as opposed to written in, let's say, Europe or overseas is that the good guy lives in the end. One of the interesting things about watching television or if you've seen some movies that were made in other countries, sometimes the hero dies. And most American made movies, we know people don't like that. They want the hero to be a hero, no matter whether it's realistic or not. All of our people, all of our heroes, all of the people we look up to, whether it be the founding fathers, as right now the popular craze is to somehow elevate them onto a pedestal that no man could ever have lived. You know, George Washington, you know, walked on water and you know, Thomas Jefferson was like the ultimate, you know, democratic, perfect person. Not. But, you know, that these weren't men or Adams, weren't men that were fallible or failable. You know, like Benjamin Franklin, who, you know, swam naked in the Thames, you know, and was a womanizer. Well, we don't talk about those things, you know, because we try to overlook the failings for the success. You know, God warns us, you know, in today's devotional about sometimes some things can overcome us. They can take away the good with which we had started. You know, you had started well running a race. You did so wonderful. You were like all excited when you got saved. But then somehow you got sidetracked. You know, you got into the world. You began to buy things, to do things, to be absorbed by the world and its ways. You listened to those who said, hey, follow me, you know, and you said, ah, oh, you know, I got grace, you know, I've got, I've got God's forgiveness. I think I'll go over here. You know, I think I'll go try this out for a while. And not only did you become like the prodigal, you might come to the place where you've actually gotten worse than the prodigal and you don't come home to the Father. There's a warning there. There's a seriousness about the times that we live in. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that also shall he reap. And that if you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap destruction. There is a place and a time that we don't know where. And it's true, I don't know. I personally will tell you up and down, I never would have believed that I am where I am today, sharing more so and doing outreach in a greater way than I ever thought I would have in the day that I got saved. Because you see, the day I got saved, I was like way back in the Jesus movement when all these pastors and ministries were growing up and things were exploding all over the world and people were like, wow. You know, it was like a marvelous, magical carpet ride. It was mystical and marvelous in our sight. You know, we, we saw the temple built and it was like, oh, the days of old when they talked about, oh, look. Everywhere you looked, everybody was a Christian. They were all getting saved. Or were they? You see, we had people like Dylan, you know, getting witness to and coming out and saying, I'm a Christian. I give up all my past mistakes. Kind of like we hear, you know, kind of rock stars today. You know, and one that I fear for, because Dylan did the same, was that a gentleman, you know, that's into the whosoever's now has kind of said, hey, you know, I like my old band. I like my old people. Well, I'm glad. Be careful. Dylan liked being a Christian until he didn't like being a Christian anymore. Then he went back to his old ways. And sadly, I think, you know, we need to be careful about the bad eating up the good. Even as we read in the devotional today, and I'll mention something personally that, you know, kind of gets to me about this, you know, that really strikes close to home and hits my heart as I consider these things. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven and well-favored and fat kind. And thin ears swallowed up the seven rank and full ears from Genesis 41, 4 through 7, or 4 and 7. There's a warning for us in that dream, just as it stands. It is possible for the best years of our life, 
the best experiences, the best victories won, the best service rendered, to be swallowed up by the times of failure, defeat, and dishonor, uselessness in the kingdom. Some men's lives of rare promise and rare achievement have ended so. It is awful to think of it, but it is true. Yet it is never necessary. S.D. Gordon has said that the only assurance of safety against this tragedy is a fresh touch with God. Daily, hourly, moment by moment, even as some have said, breath by breath. The blessed, fruitful, victorious experiences of yesterday are not only of no value to me today, but they will eventually be eaten up or reversed by today's failures unless they serve as incentives to still better and richer experiences today. A fresh touch with God by abiding in Jesus alone will keep the live cattle and kind and ill-favored grain out of my life. The warning is something similar to what some people say, don't get bitter, get better. Don't reject, but be the object of God's love. Receive from God daily, and you can move forward with God moment by moment, day by day, hourly, you know, step by step. That God is at work both to will and to do as for his good pleasure, that he would accomplish in you that which he has purposed from the beginning, written your name in the foundation, before the foundations of the world were laid, your name in the book of life. And to such, this is a great assurance and promise. But you see, there's some people and there's some lives that are going to be starting off as great giant rockets in the sky. You know, kind of like the great PTL club ministry that was so huge that its, its trees reached out into the whole world and it was able to minister to thousands and millions of people. And today, not even remember for the greatness of what it was because the man had failed in living up to what God had intended for him to be, a preacher. And he ended and died a preacher, but not as he once was. His years of leanness took away his years of prosperity. There are people today that are living prosperous lives that may have gone away from the Lord and sought to seek after the, the prophet of Baal, of Balaam, you know, in the sense of they're doing something that God has not told them to do. And that all that they might have accomplished or they might have been as men of God serving the Lord and seeing those salvations come to him may be eaten up by their own selfishness and selfish desire to be famous or hear the accolades of the people ringing in their ears. For myself, I know I experienced some of this in some way, in a small way, that God used today to speak to me, as well as has used in the past for me to give a teaching on, because there are people that go through divorce. <gasps> divorce, oh no, the unforgivable sin. God, don't you know, don't you know that, you know, you can't be divorced, you know, and you can't serve in ministry? You can't be divorced and you can't go out into the missionary field? You can't be divorced and you can't, well, in religion you can, but, you know, as far as God's concerned, guess what? Because of the hardness of the heart, Moses allowed there to be divorce. But divorce is no different than any other sin that happens in our life. You see, divorce is one of those things that God hates because he hates sin. He hates all sin. He hates evenly and equally. So, in the respect of divorce, I've gone through a divorce. <gasps> More than one. But the one I want to talk about is the first time that I had all oh, been so in love with the Lord and I, I was so excited and devoted that nothing could come between me and the love of God, you know, and I was so walking in the Spirit and exercising the gifts and doing all these things that everybody dreamed of having, you know, behind the scenes, of course, you know, and there at the capital of the Christian, contemporary Christian movement. Calvary Coast Mesa. <laughs> it wasn't really the capital, but you know, most people that went there at that time felt like it. Things were happening, things were going on, people were doing this, that, and the other thing, you know, and it was like, wow, ooh, marvelous. And so behind the scenes working, it was wonderful, you know, it was a great experience for years. And then I kind of, for the first time, backslid, you know, and fell away for a little while, you know, seeking after, you know, whoa. You know, I've never really been in a relationship. I've never had, you know, dates. You know, I've never gone on all this stuff that, you know, I wanted to experience in my life. It was like, Lord, where's my partner, you know, to go out into the ministry? And so I sought, you know, here, there, anywhere, you know, to find a partner. And sadly looked in all the wrong places, you know, and found the wrong person. Could be, 
might be. Was it the right person? We'll see. And so in the long and the short of it, being married to this person who already had a life, who had already had experiences and baggage, I thought, wow, Lord, we can minister to this person. We can talk to them. And they said to me that they didn't ever want to see me again because they were like, well, in the world and of the world and only knew the world. And so I said, well, look, God loves you. I said, you know, I personally, you know, you know, am not the best representative of that. You know, but I said, you know, we could go to church and, you know, your children whom you have, you know, they could be wonderful. You know, they could grow up, you know, no matter what you've been through. You know, we could start over. We could start with God. You know, you could begin to learn about God and, you know, all this stuff. And I had one of these wonderful ideas about how God could take my fleshly desire and make it a spiritual ramification of something that he could change the person into. And some women I know that have married pastors have done the same thing. You know, what started off as a fleshly desire turned into a spiritual reality. And some of these pastors, wives and pastors, did similar things in those days. And some of them, to the glory of God and the mercy and grace, have survived such as they are. And men of God became men of God, women of God became women of God, you know. But in my life, this marriage that was so wrong and started off so wrong was going right as I took this person to concerts, you know, to you know, places and began to share the love of God, you know, and the ministry, you know, and the ministry, the, the ministry that God was doing in her life, you know, to bring about healing. And she was healed of many things, you know, and brought to a realization of God, you know, in her life. And she made a commitment to God and she developed in her own personal relationship. And things seemed to be going that way. And things were wonderful. And so we moved out and far away, you know, to a different place, a different time, and grew up in a church, you know, smaller and more intimate. And, you know, little did I know what things were going on behind the scenes or inside a person's heart, you know, because I didn't. And as we went through, you know, except the Lord build a house, the workmen labored in vain. And all those years that I had done so much, I thought, in my early Christian walk of being so right on and strong in the Lord, were being eaten up slowly but surely by the little cancers that come into your life, the little sins that kind of slip in, the little disease that, you know, God has said, you know, no man that lays a foundation except to be laid of the Lord, you know, would prosper. And that, sure enough, those buildings that we structure and build ourselves upon the salvation that God has given to us, if they are not built of the teachings and sayings of what Jesus has said, then guess what? When the storms of life come, they'll be shaken, they'll be torn down. And my house was torn down because at the time that this all occurred, I was diseased. Oh, my health had gone. It had failed. I had literally been laid flat out in a hospital bed, dying from the disease of my own life, killing me, my flesh. The autoimmune, autoimmune systems that we have that protect us from disease had failed, and I was dying from that. It was my body was treating itself as its own disease with Crohn's disease and it was killing me and I was laying there dying when a police officer walked in and served me with papers from my wife serving me with divorce papers and being that I was dying anyways I signed and let her have her divorce oh it had led up much to that you know there had been like infidelity and those things that she had decided she wanted to do and she had pretty much ruined any type of ministry that I could have possibly dreamed ever of imagining and having because I thought, oh my God, you know, I have an unfaithful wife, what do I do with her? So I kept her and I said, I'll remain silent. Joseph, after all, kept Mary. So I told myself, I read of this self, God told me to do these things, to remain absolutely quiet. Take the sin of your wife upon yourself. And so I did. So those people that had done these things with my wife. I forgave them. I forgave my wife. I lived with my wife. I comforted her. I strengthened her. I gave her the word. I took her to those places that she would be encouraged and fail miserably. Because you see, except the Lord build a house, the labor laboreth in vain. And so all those years of what I thought I had learned in my early days of Christianity failed in the reality of my first relationship that I was in. My first relationship when I had changed my first love into love for a woman. A love of a relationship for the sake of children. A love of a relationship for the sake of a 
woman who had chosen to go astray, irregardless of knowing the truth and the reality of the love of God and the grace and mercy. And to this day, the sad part is, does she live and exist today? Yes, she does, in complete, absolute rejection of what all that God had given for her and blessed her with. To this day, she doesn't want any of it and has gone into the world even seven times worse than possibly what she had been in, sadly, to this day. And the sorrowful way with which she's ending her life has eaten up all that good that God had put into her life, even as I thought that the seven years possibly of the good that we had or whatever time that we had together, I'm not even sure how long we were married, but the point of it being is, I mean, I could figure it out if I sat down and kind of computed it, but God took it. And so the time that we were together, God had used for her salvation to make commitments and all that, but likewise, she had chosen to go a different way, chosen to be more in the flesh and of the flesh and to be around and sleep around and to try to tear down ministries and ministers and had become so bitter that she had gone after elders and deacons and people and things that she just couldn't imagine that anybody would do. And you'd think, wow, are we as guilty of that in our minds at times? Which obviously with men, sometimes it's true. You know, men get very carried away about their thoughts. And Jesus said, hey, if you lust after even another person or a woman and look after her, you know, then you've committed adultery. And so people in that time, in that place when I was pure, thought I had committed adultery. Later, maybe because I got on the beach. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but at that time, no. The beauty of the holiness of God and the innocency with which I had, with which I loved this woman, or I thought I did, and that's the key issue. I thought being pure and holy unto God would be enough that I would be so holy that, oh yes, of course I love this woman. Of course I was also consumed by her emotions and feelings that what I enjoyed of a sexual nature was not of a soulful relationship that God had established for a man and a woman to be joined together in the spirit that they should be one flesh forever into eternity and sadly this woman that the experience of life had so destroyed her life even to this day, I pray that she stay alive until she comes back to the Lord and chooses the way of life, that she would be fulfilled in eternity of those things that she could not get in this temporary life that she's chosen, this life of obsession with the flesh, the possession of what has her and what enveloped her, what has caused her life to be less than fulfilled. As a matter of fact, a testimony of what life should not be. And so, I had assumed, oh, well, never again. I'll never be used by the Lord. God will never love me again. Woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of sin, you know, because my wife has divorced me. And so, when I left that moment of being served papers, when I went far from the town that she was in, because they had sent me far away to be taking care of in the, the Veterans, Associ Veterans Administration hospitals, you know, up in Portland. You know, God knows that when I left, people thought I would die. And in some ways, for myself, I did. Because the joy of my heart was gone. The love of my life, I thought, was gone. The life I thought that God could use and move and peace be established in it was gone. The ministry that I thought God wanted me to be was gone. The hopes, the dreams, the challenges, the reality of knowing Jesus in a personal and intimate way. Oh, God was there. And God was still trying to talk to me. My sorrows and my woes had come upon me. And I was mourning and in death's grip. And when I arrived in Portland and they took care of me, the pain and the agony of having this disease tearing me apart was so enveloping that I had no opportunities to think. It took almost six months, to, uh, six months to a year to recover from that. And when I did, I was barely alive. And when they discharged me, they didn't think that I would make it, honestly. 
And in those days, it was a challenge. It was one of the hardest things that you find in life to face the reality of your own mistakes as well as your own accomplishments and then discover that God loves you anyways. It's one of the biggest challenges in life to be a divorced person and to be a testimony to those around you that divorce is not the end of the world. It's one of the greatest challenges that God has given me because when I chose to follow Jesus in the early days of my Christian walk, I said to the Lord, yes, I will choose to follow any way you lead me and in the way that I should go if it's the way of suffering as I have read of all these different people's histories of all these saints that have gone in a way less traveled. Whatever you want from me, Lord, I will do. And so God began to heal me, to hear me, to help me, to cause me to understand the life I was living, the things that I had gone through, the experience of divorce and why God hates divorce, and then how I was able to minister to others who had gone through such a tragedy and a travesty of what God intended for the church to be because in reality God knows what divorce is because the church does it all the time. The church divorces itself from being personally involved with God and turns its back on God and goes its own way. Just like a bride led astray or a woman who's rejected its maker or its maker, its master and a bride that's rejected its groom. Oftentimes we see that in the scriptures when the children of Israel rebelled against the Lord. And so God began to use me in intimate ways without being in front of people because I had this backwards and idealism, this backwards reverse engineering, you know, that thought, oh God, you know, you deconstructed what you constructed in me when I first got saved. All the great visions and ministries and words that you had said you would do in my life, that you would use me for. Oh God, such as I am, I can never be, so I'll just be behind the scenes for the rest of my life being not as a minister to those administering your grace, but rather being a servant unto all, for such is the sin that I've committed and I've been committed unto. For had I just stuck with you, Lord, from the beginning, I would be the Greg Lorries, the Mike McIntoshes, the Raul Reeses, the people that were so perfect, I thought, so holy. Oh, Lord, why did I ever leave? Why did I ever go my own way? Why did I ever seek to have something that only you could build in my life? And it took years to be healed. As a matter of fact, for the longest time, the last grasp of those clutches of Satan hanging on to my conscience, though I still moved in ministry, though I still did things underneath the ministry of others, inside of the church and Christendom, as the Lord would give me ability and heal me of my own inf of my own fallibilities and my own fears and my own self-condemnations, I would minister as best I could with the joy that I had at times with the, the ministry that God has given me to be in those days consolation of the son of consolation. That as I one day was finally healed of the last vestige of guilt because guilt is a powerful force. A lot of people out there that go through divorce know this. Guilt means that you look back at and try to take upon yourself all that was done. And you're not always the only one guilty. Now, as a Christian, you feel like you're the one. Women do this a lot. Women in a divorce destroy any esteem they have because they esteem themselves as the fault of everything that happened in the divorce. And so a lot of times they need a acute way of acute way of immediate we would call it intensive care you know you have to put a woman in tight intensive care you know and really love on that person because that person has gone through some really tragic heart soul wrenching experiences that God knows only he can heal and that's what intensive care does you know it heals the immediate death causing problems that are killing the body and that's what lots of times women in a divorce need. But most people don't talk about the man too much. I was the emotive type man, the emotional one, the one who had feelings, the one who was devastated and destroyed and nearly died from it. And so experiencing that, God used that. And I learned finally at the later years of my life, God meant that for good. What 
Satan intended for evil, God had turned to good. And it took years and many ministries and many ministerings and reaching out and touching other people's lives and helping them and seeing them succeed and blessing them and encouraging them and strengthening them and you know, holding them up in prayer and holding them up in my hands even and watching them you know, struggle and go through life that I discovered God was like that. God doesn't tell you to, hey, you know, be perfect so that you can have a perfect ministry. <laughs> no, far from it. As a matter of fact, if you read the Old Testament and you look through the New Testament, you'll see that most of the ministry that God has allowed people to do isn't perfect. You'll see them stumble. You'll see them fumble. You'll see them fall. But today's devotional was about seven years of ill being eaten up the seven years of good and that the dream was a warning to those who should recognize that hey if you're standing in your own righteousness if you're standing in your perfect marriage if you think you've got it all together oh be careful you'll fall because though you may be in what you think of as the unassailable castle you know of fortitude and strong and solitude I can tell you something this most Christian marriages go through divorce. Most. Right now we have more than 50%. Most people experience divorce don't talk about it because there is no real ministry to divorced people that should be there, that should be a part of, hey, let's open up the door so that we can be real about it. Oh no, let's go behind the door so we can talk about it because we, after all, we want marriages to be perfect to begin with. We don't want to deal with the consequences of what society is like, much less Christian society, of bad marriages staying together when they never should have been together in the first place. We don't talk about that or the man beating the wife or the, you know, the marriage bed is undefiled, so guess what? That marriage bed is also the place where tortures and adulteresses, adultery and fornications and all kinds of things go on that, oh, well, we don't talk about that. It's undefiled covered. No, it's not. Because the hardness of a man's heart is why God allowed divorce in the first place. And the hardness of a man's heart is why God wants us to be truthful and honest. And until we come to that place that, yes, marriages as the Christian virtue are going to be eat up by those sins that are inside of those marriages that look like they're unassailable, they're perfect. Oh, there are some that obviously will survive irregardless or regardless because God established them from the beginning and no matter what they go through you know they'll still make it you know I think of things like BJ Thomas you know where you know his testimony about his wife was that she prayed for him and he beat her according to him and that in that with which she endured all his philandering and all the things going on she finally saw his salvation and finally saw him come back to the relationship that they had and in the end his better years were the latter years as opposed to the former years even though the latter years may have eaten up all the benefits from his former years and that's what the cattle kind of like you know the, the good years and the bad years eating up be careful when you look at your life because you may think you're on top of the world you know everything's smooth sailing until the storms of life come, whether it be menopause for a woman, when you suddenly discover that she doesn't want to see you, she doesn't want to touch you, she doesn't want to feel you, she doesn't want to have anything to do with you, and you think, oh my God, you know, and you go through kind of like adjustments, you know, and you try to make an adjustment, and you fail in your adjustments, and suddenly you discover, you know, I don't want this, and you go and divorce for menopause, or as many stars do in that's why they don't talk about it because they don't want to admit they can't deal with their own hardness of heart or that men go through menopause or they say middle age crazy or whatever it may be in this metabolic you know adaption to getting older they get more what selfish more self-centered more self-oriented more less of ministering to others and denying themselves in their latter years that they're more into what in their former years 
it eats up all the good that they had, the wood that they did. I think of someone like Luther, you know. Luther seemed to have been a wonderful person. I read his life, you know, and I, I, I look at him and I go, you know, there's a, there's a lot of good about this guy, you know. Luther was a pretty good guy, you know. He, he didn't really want to start Lutherans, you know. I mean, he didn't really want to start another denomination or split from the church, though he did, without meaning to. He wanted to reform the church, change it back to what he saw as it being, you know, biblical and scriptural. And so, you know, he did his edicts, you know, and he said those things, you know, and unfortunately it caused this, you know, split that's, you know, lasted through the centuries. But one of the things that, you know, people like about Luther and, you know, and Luther is that, you know, he did split, you know, he did cause this split, but they don't remember kind of some of the things he did that may have been wrong from somebody else's perspective. Like, if you're Jewish, you kind of look at Luther and you go, you know, he started out pretty good, you know, he wanted to tell the Jews they're wonderful people, you know, that they're God's chosen people, that yes, you should love them and accept them and do their thing. But then at the end of his life, he got bitter. And what little good he did for the Jewish people was swallowed up and stomped on by the time he died because he started making statements that were like off the wall. Those Jews are just children of Satan and blah, 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 you know, and mouthed off. And people wrote down what he mouthed off. Now, I hope in my latter years, if I become senile, <laughs> somebody would recognize, uh, we're not going to record his senility. We're not going to record his civility. We're going to recognize what his ability was when God used him and what was anointed by God to be used. Not something that in my old age I might have said, you know, out of the corner of my mouth, so to speak, without there being forethought or the inspiration of God. And I see that being one of the things that Jews remember about Luther, as opposed to Christians wondering why Jews aren't so thrilled about Luther. Good reason why. I noticed recently that there's also some men of God in Christendom today that, you know, whether it be a Billy Graham or a Chuck Smith that may have said something at one point in time, and then now they've run with one statement. You know, I know it. A person, John McCarthy, who says, "Oh, well, Billy Graham's off the wall. You know, he just—you can't trust him. You know, he says this. You know, blah blah blah. You know, at 89 years old or 90 or whatever. You know, and then it's taken out of proportion and it's blown out of proportion and it's taken out of context. And suddenly now it's all that Billy Graham believes in, according to one man's opinion. And I say, no, that's not what the man himself says. Because if you ask him, he'll tell you what he believes in, and he's." old enough, still coherent enough to tell you. But rather than get together and join himself by asking, he'd rather speak without seeking, condemn without conversation, commend himself as righteous, as opposed to being capable of saying things maybe he shouldn't be saying about a man of God. And that's what happened in my life, was that in my early days, oh, I was still just as much the same way I am today, you know, loving the Lord and just full of joy and babbling and <laughs> laughing and carrying on and loving the Lord with all my heart, without the experiences of life, you know, hitting me. But as the experiences of life hit me, I began to see how we become either tender or we become turned. You either become sensitized or you become hardened of heart. You either allow that gnashing of life's experiences to crush you, to mush you, to like little knives being stabbed into you to make that meat tender. Because if you've been given the Word of God as meat, you know, solid meat where you really know the Word of God, except that it be stabbed and sliced and diced, you know, and put into a, a meat tenderizer, guess what? You become rough and tough kind of like that man of God I just told you about. And you start pointing fingers at other people and you start making things you know, up that you think are so important that really aren't. And suddenly your ministry of however many years, seven years we use because it's a number of completion or, you know, we don't really know what seven is completely, but we, we think we do. But anyway, seven being, you know, a cycle until it starts something new cycle, you know, like seven days in the week and all that stuff. But those seven years of you being on top of the world might get ate up by seven years of you being on the bottom of the world and might consume all the good that you did. Be careful. It can happen. Don't let seven years of bitterness 
ruin seven years of blessing. That's the point of what happens now. We've gone through oh so many times of watching, you know, in this current administration, seven years now of taking away from what we had seven years of being blessed with. And so now we're suddenly bitter, not better. And you gotta recognize that about your own life about your own wife, about your own children, about your own world, about your job, about the things that you're going through. There may be a bitter time that follows a blessing time and that you have to be careful you don't let one consume the other and that you become the result of the most recent occasions you've gone through. If you're blessed, enjoy it. If you're not, enjoy it too. Rejoice in the Lord always. And so. My life, when I look back at those experiences that I had that were so whew, powerful an effect in my life, my divorce, I thank God for it. I thank God for the experience of having gone through that relationship with my first wife to change me and to make me into the person I am today, tenderized, sensitized, challenged by, grown through, developed from, and scarred with that experience that God could take and make into, through the breakings thereof, the tender person in the heart that I have inside. That I can look at another man, woman, child, people that have gone through divorce and say to them, oh man, don't get bitter, get better. Here, let me tell you about my life. Because the absolute tragedy of what it was should have consumed all that I am. But look today at my wife. <laughs> my wife, I tease her. I say, you're my current wife because <laughs> I've gone through some experiences. Needless to say, it didn't happen overnight. But I tell people, look at my wife. Ask her. Ask her what our relationship is like, what we do daily, what we do and enjoy and employ. Do we argue? Of course. Do we have struggles? Yes. Do we challenge each other? Oh, yeah. Has she been put through the mill and the grindstone? Of course, just like I have. And that mill and grindstone is that with which makes bread out of our lives so that we would be that which God could use to minister to others and feed them from the experiences that we've gone through. And so one of the things I learned in that divorce part was that one of the things I love about my wife is, you know, every morning she hears these words, you're beautiful or gorgeous, either one, but you know, it's done in a goofy way. And I laugh and carry on with her and enjoy her for today. Because today is all I have with her. Oh, I may have her tomorrow, but I'm only promised today. And so today I make her day full of all the salvation that I have, full of all my relationship of love that I have for her, full of everything I can possibly put into that day for her. Because that's all I have. I only have today. And that's all you have today. You have right now, this moment in your life today, wherever you are, whatever you are, however you are. If you're divorced, you only have today. Don't go planning on tomorrow because you don't have tomorrow. You might get it, but you don't have it. And the point of that being is that while it's today, harden not your heart as it says provocation, but if you hear his voice, do as he says. But the point is having today make it what you would have it to be for eternity. If you have today a wife, then bless her. Be loved and love. Forgive and be forgiven. Show grace, be graceful. In those throughout the day, though you may start the day in love, don't take those seven minutes of you know that time you might have of telling her you love her and then let seven hours of whatever goes on in life today ruin it. But rather at the end of the day, also turn it around again from those seven hours of whatever it may be that you've gone through life to turn it into a blessing again. Begin your day and end your day as a blessing unto your wife and you'll find that your life will continue to have a wife in it all the days of your life. Because God said it's not good that man should be alone. And I know for myself I was never meant to be alone. <laughs> Even though my wife may say, well, you're, I'm alone. you're alone a lot. You know, well, not really. I'm with the Lord. But the, the point is that God uses your personality quirks and brings the perfect person in to fit that quirk. And so at the end of my day, 
My wife every day hears me say to her, I love her, at the beginning and at the end, and hears me, oh, she may not remember sometimes, and at the end of her day, she hears me say how beautiful she is and gorgeous, or sexy sometimes I might say, you know, playing on flesh. But the point being is that enjoy today. That's what you have. Don't let previous years, future years, or anything tear you away from enjoying this day of what God has given you today to be. Because that's all you're promised. You're not promised tomorrow. Today, be thou an example of a believer, and you'll find that God will make you a believer all the days of your life, every day, as you learn to live it one day at a time.